seems uh, inevitable that sometime in this coming century, humanity is going to attempt to settle some world beyond Earth. Space settlement. It looks like uh, Conbro Chill might actually be kind of on the way already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, space settlement, something that is probably going to start sometime in this century, is an idea that we've had for a long time. We've been thinking about it for a long time. Renaissance astronomers uh, suspected that distant suns had distant planets, Earth-like planets. Today, we use high technology to discover exoplanets at a rate of roughly one per day. And Mars is swarmed by robotic explorers, some in orbit, some on the surface. They're making detailed maps. And the international research team of Icarus Interstellar are designing world ships to take entire populations, tens of thousands of people, sometimes to these exoplanets around other suns. Their physicists work on the propulsion dynamics and propulsion systems. Some of them haven't yet been invented. I work on the population genetics of entire populations hurtling through space, tens of thousands of people in this closed system on multi-generational voyages. There's a good reason for all of this. It's adaptation. It's evolution. And it gives us species insurance in the long run. There have been about five major catastrophes in the history of Earth life. The last one took out the dinosaurs. They had nowhere to go when the catastrophe came. The dinosaurs didn't have a space program. <laughs> I'm an archaeologist. I study human evolution and patterns in human evolution. And we also see that closer in on our time scale, all of the ancient civilizations have fallen. All of the ancient civilizations have failed. In the past, independent civilizations could fall apart and others could continue. But today, there is one global civilization entirely interconnected. What happens when a global civilization falls? It can't be nice. For all of these reasons, for the last few generations, the greatest thinkers about the distant human future have all told us the same thing. Go to space, says Stephen Hawking, <laughs> or face extinction on Earth. This is the long term. As an archaeologist, I was persuaded by this. And I asked myself, how would we do this? How would humanity do this? If I was going to, as an archaeologist, use what we've understood about human evolution in the past to give ourselves a better future in the long term. How would this be done? It would be done by adaptation. It would be done by the same processes that have allowed humanity to settle and adapt to environments across the globe in the past 50,000 years. Adaptation. In the Pacific, people adapted by inventing massive sailing vessels. 3,200 years ago, they carried domesticated plants and animals. They invented stellar navigation, it's navigating by the stars. Entire families went out to sea. They sailed upwind. It wasn't a mistake. They sailed into the wind, and they explored the Pacific. To learn about this, I went to the Pacific. We built a replica of a pre-Columbian sailing vessel, a thousand miles up the west coast of South America. I learned how to build something from a concept. I learned how to go from documents by the conquistadors describing these vessels to a completed vessel. I learned how to sail, how to navigate by the stars, how to explore. We, thank you. That's my buddy Dave Moore. Here's the med, he's the medic on board. I also learned about the Arctic. People adapted to the Arctic by inventing dog sleds. These are uh, uh, vehicles, essentially, that pull people's supplies over vast ice scapes. They invented harpooning equipment. They invented uh, 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 
polar clothing that is as effective as modern polar clothing. They adapted to the Arctic. Well, I knew about the Arctic as well. I'd spent a lot of time in the Arctic. This is on my fourth expedition to Iceland. Uh, this is 28 days by myself. Here, you, if you can see me there. 28 days by myself on the uh, Vatnajökull ice cap. I was learning there to live like an astronaut. I had one radio daily contact, one radio contact per day. Uh, I was pulling all of my supplies. My entire life is dependent on the supplies that I'm pulling behind me. 40 days worth of supplies. Again, I was learning how to explore. I was learning how to learn a landscape. In diving, I had learned about safety through redundancy. And in flying my glider, I learned about safety through redundancy. So I thought, how can I contribute to this larger project of space colonization? I thought, well, a cathedral is incomprehensible. The size, the scale of a cathedral is incomprehensible unless you remember that it was built by hundreds of masons and woodworkers, sometimes over centuries. Space programs are the same thing. No one engineer could build the Saturn V to take you a quarter million miles to the moon. But 300,000 engineers <laughs> spread across the United States. They could, and they did, and they put us on the moon. All of those experiences, then, I'm thinking, what, what can I do? What part of technology can I examine? All of those funneled me down to this one piece of equipment, which is the spacesuit. This is in the Arctic again, but the suits that I was wearing, the garments that I was wearing in the Arctic for Arctic exploration, had a lot of strong, important similarities with spacesuits. I thought I would tackle spacesuits. I began with research. Oregon, what a place. The first pressure suit patent filed by Fred Sample of Independence, Oregon in 1919. <laughs> by the 1930s, crude suits, crude but effective, suits were being used to explore the lower stratosphere. By the 1990s, NASA suits weighed a lot. They cost a lot, $100,000. Russian suits are roughly the same cost, or actually about half the cost and about half the weight, but still into the many tens of thousands of dollars. It's one of the many barriers to space exploration is cost. We wanted to reduce cost. So my project has been to reduce cost, make them lighter, down to five kilos or 11 pounds roughly, and cheaper. I want to make the $1,000 spacesuit rather than the $100,000 spacesuit. <clears throat> uh, thanks. We, get, we began building. I learned that the technologies were simple. Spacesuits have roughly four layers. The first is a, therm a, a thermal layer. It's a coolant garment. It circulates ice water. This circulates ice water across hoses or through hoses across your body, picking up your body heat and dumping it overboard. The water is recycled, though. The water is not dumped. It's just your body heat that's exhausted. We sewed aquarium hose <laughs> into a long john garment. The second layer is a pressure bladder. This holds a bubble of high pressure gas around your body so that the nitrogen in your, in your tissues doesn't fizz like, like soda bubbles when you're exposed to vacuum. That's decompression sickness. It's lethal. Our first bladders were diving suits, which we adapted nicely. Uh, now we're making our own bladders again. Don't rely on them. Make it cheaper. Making our own bladders because we've learned how to make our own gas-tight seams. Third layer is a restraint mesh. You can see multiple layers in this, uh, the, this drawing I'm showing you. That We've got multiple layers going on here, and you have to coordinate them. It gets awfully complicated. There are more layers coming. <laughs> That restraint mesh layer gives you a posture. The posture that the suit wants to take when it's inflated if you're standing there is this. <laughs> Looks good, but uh, not very useful inside a spacecraft. This is the posture, or this is beginning to give you the posture that you get in a spacecraft. You need a crouched position for inside a spacecraft. That's what the pressure restraint layer does. The fourth layer is a coverall. This is a, an orange uh, coverall garment. This gives you uh, protection from flames. It's flame-proof. It's got pockets for your survival radio, things like that. It's essentially a survival uh, suit or, or a rescue suit. That's the fourth layer. After we build the suits, we test them. Here we're in a cold chamber. We're looking at temperatures. We're trying to find out what gets brittle at 40 below, let's say. What works and what doesn't. Altitude chamber, high altitude testing. Our friends at Copenhagen Suborbitals in Denmark gave us access to their chamber. They put me inside, sealed up the suit, dumped the gas from the chamber, 
simulating high altitude. They monitored my biomedical system, and everything was working beautifully. My bios, biomedicals were all good. Best way to find a leak in a pressure suit is underwater. <laughs> you look for bubbles coming off the suit. My brother has a swimming pool. <laughs> it doesn't say NASA, you know, official NASA swimming test facility or immersion facility, but it is full of water. <laughs> and that's all we need. You can see the bubbles. We're safe, though. We're not crazy. We have here are、uh, safety divers watching me, making sure that I'm safe. Divers from the Oregon Scuba Club. Trying to get to the next slide. There we are. Flight testing, very exciting. Last summer, we're up to 17,000 feet in a Bell Jet Ranger. They put me in the back of the,、uh, the, the seat here. I was strapped in, pressurized,、uh, oxygen fed to me,、uh, and up we went. I say we or I sometimes. I mean we. There's an entire team called Pacific Space Flight. All of them have checklists, and we work to a very、uh, careful timeline. Flight testing, 17,000 feet. Everything worked beautifully. We come back down an hour later. Everything is fine. We're going higher and higher now. We're going to switch to balloons. By the end of this year, we start flying balloons up above、uh, Mount Everest altitude. We'll be looking down at airliners, which will be、uh, interesting,、uh, and then ultimately to 65,000 feet of very high altitude with gas balloons. So we're testing exactly in the way that NASA tested 60,、uh, 50 years ago. What we're doing then is evolving the design of spacesuits. You can see the diagrams here. They're getting less and less cluttered as we go. They're getting lighter and lesser. We are putting our little piece of the cathedral of space colonization together. This is our piece. I've shown you a lot of pictures. Let's look at the real thing. How about the real thing? Let's bring out the first one. This is Ben Wilson. He's one of our test subjects. He also he wears the suits. He's been in them for tens of hours. Uh, he's an active mountaineer、uh, and a graduate of Portland State. <laughs> you see, he doesn't have the orange coverall. I've left the coveralls off, so you can see the underside. What this is more interesting. What you're seeing in here is all kinds of restraints and all kinds of connections that reinforce the suit and again give it a posture. He's being cooled. He's getting gas to breathe. I hope he's comfortable. We haven't installed radios for today. We have them for other purposes,、um, but I'm hoping he's okay. <laughs>、um, Alex Napton is、uh, running the cabinet.、Um, <laughs> Alexander is、uh, a cadet at the Hillsborough Air Academy. He's going to、uh, learn how to fly. Michael Rudis is there. He's got a number of patches on his suit. He used to work for NASA. <laughs> Let's see the next suit. We have zero seconds remaining. Let's see the next suit, please. Now this one is much lighter, and this has only been built in the last four months. <laughs> this one, pick up the lines, please, off the ground. Michael, if you pick the lines off the ground. Now this is extremely light and extremely cheap. Again, it took several hundred hours to build this. This is Amy Magruder. She's a, one of our test subjects. She builds the suits. She designs parts of them. She's been in them to Apollo suit pressures. <laughs> I think that's about it. There are the suits, and they're getting lighter. All right. 